This is Alnaby Hall Farm in County Durham, and we've been invited here to explore the village that surrounds it, or rather mysteriously doesn't. Because at some point in time, Alnaby Village was deserted and almost completely vanished. Almost because this field contains the remains of the village. In fact, it's an absolute maze of mounds. Look at this photo. You can see homes, gardens, streets, absolutely acres of archaeology to dig. So will this field give us a window into the world of the medieval peasant? The life that you or I would have lived in the Middle Ages? Well, that's our challenge. To tell the story, not just of one house or a chapel or the manor, but of the whole village. Alnaby Hall Farm lies near Darlington in County Durham. Today, its 17th century farmhouse is surrounded by fields of grazing cattle and freezing archaeologists. But it's what lies beneath those fields that's got Mick champing at the bit. I don't think I've ever seen a field with so many lumps in it. It's absolutely fantastic, isn't it? I cut my teeth on sites like this. It's so well preserved. There is one thing that worries me, though. This is a big field. We've yeah. got three days. It's a whole village. How do we know what to target? Well, we, we can pick certain bits of it that I think that'll answer certain questions, like, you know, what's the origin of the village? When did it first start here? What did it look like when it was flourishing? And, of course, why did it disappear? You should be able to learn all of that. Stuart, I think we're going to need you to start us off. <laughs> Great, isn't it, this site? <laughs> Earthworks at last. Oh, I knew we'd like that. Well, we're really lucky on this site because last year English Heritage undertook a really detailed, carefully measured survey of all the lumps and bumps on yeah. this site. Can you tell what this stuff is, though? Because to me, it just looks like a bloke's face who needs <laughs> a shave. You'll see in all these lumps and bumps, you can see patterns of things starting to emerge. You can see straight lines down there. You can see regular divisions of things. See, these are patterns that we can recognise. So as far as you're concerned, we don't really need to bother to dig it at all, do we? <laughs> I mean, the, re realistically, the one thing we don't have is date. Yeah. Is this all going to be about foundations? I want to know about the people. Well, there will be foundations because we can see the outlines of buildings. But we note out at the back of the houses, we're going to get rubbish pits and dung heaps and stuff where we get pottery, animal bone, food remains. And that's what will tell us about the daily life of the villagers. Unusually for Time Team, we seem to know a lot about the site before we've even started digging. To Mick and Stewart's expert eyes, these lumps are clearly the remains of collapsed walls and reveal a road, a village green and individual house plots. But what we don't have are any dates for the village, or indeed any evidence of the people who lived in it. So we're starting with two house plots Stuart's identified on the edge of the green and geophysing them to see if we can pick up any rubbish pits or other signs of occupation. And it doesn't take long before John thinks he's identified a house. But that black, you say, is a building? Yes, but not a stone building, I don't think. There's no indication of clear wall lines as no. such. I think you may be looking at sort of mud walls or something of that sort of order. But you see, the value of these geophysics, they may not show very much, but if we are dealing with mud walls and, and clay walls, at least it gives us an indication of what we're going to be looking for. It's going to be a lot more difficult to find than stone walls, but I find this very, very valuable information. Mm. I'm sure you'll manage. <laughs> So the archaeologists take up residence digging our first trench. Bang on top of the building, John's identified on the geophys. And while they're searching for dating evidence in the ground, we're also turning to a wealth of local documents for other clues. What's the earliest reference we've got to Alnaby? Well, it's not exactly a reference, but it's the place name. That BY ending is a Norse term for a farmstead, so that name would have been coined probably at the end of the 9th or the early 10th century. So does that mean we're looking at a Viking village? Well, not necessarily. I mean, it could be, but, you know, this name was coined for a settlement somewhere in the vicinity, but that doesn't necessarily mean to say that it, it refers to the settlement that we're digging. 
So when do we know that it was established as a village? Well, the first reference we've got is from 1198, when one William Greystoke was obliged to provide um, a knight or the equivalent amount of money um, in service to the bishops of Durham in return for holding land at Conniscliffe and at Olmaby. So does that mean that there was definitely a village here in the 12th century? No, it means that there was a manor here in the 12th century. Now, whether or not there's a village, well, we're going to have to dig to find that out. So, back to the trench, and Phil's hunt for the house, which we think will be made of turf. But then again, maybe not. <laughs> Matt? Hello? <laughs> Have a look at this. Now, John promised me there'd be no stone in here. <laughs> <laughs> so you've won your five pounds already? Well, I don't know. 11 o'clock day one, and it looks as though we might have our first archaeological hint of a house. But although we've barely scratched the surface of this target, it seems Mick's already switched his attention to something else. It was only about five minutes ago that we started putting in this trench, but this being time team, over here you can see the strings down, there's people bouncing up and down trying to do some deturfing. It's the second trench, isn't it? It is indeed, but yes. But why? And why so close to that one? Well. When you look at these plans, there are almost certainly different phases of development of the village here. What do you mean different phases? Well, if you go in a village today, you'll have, you know, Georgian houses in one place, Tudor houses in another place. You know, the place has developed gradually. It's developed over a period. This is almost certainly the same. From the look of the earthworks, we think that area over there might be earlier. So that's why that trench has gone in. And we think this is part of a row of farms. So you think this might be later? At the moment, I think I'd put a cheap bottle of wine on that. Yeah. You chuck your money about, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Before Mick starts getting the drinks in, we've got a lot more digging to do. And our second trench has gone in over another possible house platform. Mick and Stuart think that this second house is later than Phil's house. Their theory being Phil's digging a possible house which forms part of this plot. They believe that his is the earliest dwelling in the village. They think this because it's cut through by a bank which forms the front boundary of the second plot. They're incredibly confident about their interpretation of these lumps and bumps. Personally, I'd err on the side of caution until we get some dates, but mix in a pretty persuasive mood. It's so regular and loud, I think it must be planned. So who would have planned it? Well, probably the Lord of the Manor at the time. So would there have been a model, some kind of template they'd have worked from? Well, if I draw you a little sketch look, if you take that uh, earthwork plan, we've got a big rectangular open space in the middle, which is the village green. That is the space between a couple of rows of plots, which are where the medieval farmers had their farmsteads. Each of those would have had a farmhouse on it. I've only drawn one building on, yeah. because most, at the, at the time that a village like this was occupied, everything took place in one building. So you go through the door, and if you're human, you turn left. If you're not, you turn right into the, 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 the cattle end. Yeah. I mean, that combined with their diet must mean that it was an extremely smelly place to live in. It may have been smelly in the medieval period, but there's a whiff of excitement on site right now as Phil's trench is full of surprises. God, that looks good, Phil. Ah! You've got but, lots of stuff there. Ah, but don't be misled. Go on. Those are not stones. Oh, go on. <laughs> no, they're not. Who's told you that? <laughs> well, John did. He All said, right. whatever you do, when you dig here, you will not find stones. This would be the acid test. Now, you know what a, so a stone sounds I like. I think so, yeah. Now, yeah. that's not a, sto not a stone, is it? That's soft archaeology, Phil. Is that right? That's everything, what Stuart said. Everything was going to be totally clay-like and earthen. Now, okay. do you really want to know what's there? Yes. Well, there looks like a stone wall there. Really? <laughs> yes! <laughs> Are you listening, John? Yes. <laughs> so not exactly what Stuart predicted from the earthwork survey. But I've got to admit it looks like we might have our first hint of a house on this site. Over in Trench 2, it seems that the archaeology is equally well-preserved, and we're also beginning to find walls. 
but we're going to need more than a few stones to reveal Alnaby's story and the lives of its peasants. All the archaeologists are talking about are foundations and building platforms, but there's no sign of any villagers. Are you having the same problem with the documents? Well, yeah, I mean, most of the documents refer to the Lord and, and his properties, um, but this one's a little bit more interesting. This is a will from 1320 of Marmaduke Fitzjohn. He lists the uh, produce that's um, owed by the peasants to the Lord, and this includes uh, wheat and oats and barley, and they also have to provide tables and chests and and pails and so on and so forth. So it gives us an insight into what the peasants would be doing during their daily lives and how to render to the Lord. By picking out snippets of information from our documents, we're beginning to glimpse the agricultural lifestyle of our medieval peasants. But we really need solid evidence in the ground to tell the story of Ulnaby and its villagers. And having left the archaeologists alone in the cold for one minute, they've begun to open a third trench. Yet another trench. We've gone trench crazy today. <laughs> Is this your doing? Might have something to do with it, yes. <laughs> Why? Why are we putting a trench in here? Well, you see these regular divisions of things along here. They have a certain space element to them. Like with the house and the, and the garden around it, effectively. And what's interesting here is that one of these regular divisions appears to be subdivided. And what we've got is a building right on the end of it. So is this one of the last cottages in this medieval village? So that's what we want to examine here. John, geophysics is a bit redundant this time. <laughs> no, it? it's not. It, we've actually surveyed this magnetically now, and we're getting some really nice results. We're getting lots of strong anomalies. They reflect the buildings, the yards, areas of burning, rubbish pits and so on. And Stuart talked about this rectangular building. It's difficult to see on this plot because I've only just produced it, but look, there's very strong anomalies there and they're right at this end of the building. It's just possible we've either got a large pit there or maybe a fireplace. So, Trench 3 is going in here because Stuart thinks the subdivision of this plot suggests even later occupation. The archaeologists now hope that Trench 1 should give us the beginning of the village, Trench 2 the middle and Trench 3 its end. I'm still amazed by their confidence, since we've hardly found any dating evidence at all yet. In Trench 2, we've added a floor surface to the wall bridge exposed, but at the moment the finds are a bit thin on the ground. We have got uh, two little pieces here with the very shiny brown glaze, which are definitely, you know, 18th century or later. Quite typical of what you'd find in the topsoil yeah, kicking around the site. Mi mixed up, yeah. Over in Trench 1, Phil might have saved the day with a curious object he thinks belonged to one of our villagers. It's a piece of work bone. Oh. You see, along here, you can see this edge here is really, really sharp. It's a snapped edge. Yeah. But if you look at this, you can see that both sides are actually tapering up. Mm. It's sort of like an arch shape. And, and when you look around here, you can see all these edges here are totally smoothed off. Now that is a deliberate shaping of that piece of bone. But looking at it, you can't help but feeling sort of you want to sort of like taper a little handle, you know, like, a, like a little spoon. But un unquestionably, this is the sort of, to me, everyday item I think everybody would have had. So at last, a real possession from a real medieval peasant. But before we get too excited, Stuart now thinks there's much more to this site than we first thought, and this trackway is the key. This is clearly an old road, this hollow way we're walking down, isn't it? It, it is, I and mean, as you can see, and this is clearly a well-developed hollow way. It's been used yeah. over a long period of time. Yeah. It sort of heads towards that ploughed field over there, yeah. and it's, it's not a cul-de-sac, clearly, this depth of roadway, and it's just possible we have properties coming along this roadway and yeah. disappeared into that field. So, nearly the end of day one, and our site might just have doubled in size. If that road continued into the next field, it's likely the village did as well. But we'll have to worry about that tomorrow. And apart from geophysing the area, we're keeping focused on the lumps and bumps in this field. In our newly opened Trench 3, we're already starting to uncover some fairly solid stonework, but it's too soon to tell whether it forms some part of a building. But in Trench 2, it looks like Bridges House is shaping up nicely. That's a nice-looking wall. Uh, you might think so, Tony. 
But actually, what I think you're looking at is something like a revetment. Why would you put up a revetment here? Well, revetment would be used to protect the building that I'm standing in here. And you've got a fairly flimsy building made of timber here. You may want to keep it safe if this is particularly damp. So let's make a nice, strong superstructure um, and keep your health safe. But you're assuming that there is a property here? Well, definitely. I'm sure there's a property here because if you look behind me, just down here, you can see these big stones. Cool, they're great. Yeah, I mean, it looks like flag flooring inside. Any finds? Yeah, there is. There's a really nice piece of 13th century pottery. It's a rim, and it's from a large jar. Really, really nice diagnostic piece. So, in the last hour of the day, we've got some real archaeology that dates the village back to the 1200s. It's been a really busy day. We've put in three trenches. As you can see, we're just getting down on top of the medieval village. But, of course, we don't know how it all links together yet. And there's no reason to assume that the village stops at that fence line. So, tomorrow, we're going to go down this little road, what's known as the Hollow Way, to see what's on the other side. History Hit is an award-winning streaming platform built by history fans for history fans. Enjoy our rich library of documentaries covering key events and locations of the medieval period. History Hit's medieval offering features leading historians such as Dan Jones, Eleanor Yanega and Kat Jarman. Not only that, but we have a rich library of audio documentaries covering every period of history through our network of podcasts. Sign up now for a free trial and Chronicle fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code CHRONICLE at checkout. Beginning at day two here at Alnaby Hall Farm in County Durham, where we're investigating the lost medieval village, which we're pretty sure lies underneath this field. Yesterday we put in a trench here because Stuart reckons that this earthwork represents one of the earliest buildings on the site, although he didn't think that it was made of stone. Phil, was he right? I think he's wrong on both counts, actually. Firstly, we've got no evidence of a building here at the moment. And secondly, we do have stone. Now, that stone, I think, is a much later wall, probably just a, a spread of material. But the crucial thing is we've got no evidence of a building at all. True, we've got a few bits of medieval pottery, but we're in the middle of a medieval village. You'd expect that. So what we're going to have to do is going to be a bit more brutal. We're going to take a digger to it and go down. Stuart's been walking these hills for 40 years. He knows them at the back of his hand. It's going to be great telling him who's wrong. <laughs> First time for everything. Not the most encouraging start to the day, but when the archaeology gets tough, the archaeologists get tougher. So Phil gets stuck in with the big digger to shift the dirt and see whether there's any evidence of occupation in his trench. So far, we've opened three trenches based on Stuart's interpretation of all the lumps and bumps in the field. Although Phil's struggling to find anything in his trench, we still think it's located on the site of an early house platform. We think Bridges' trench is located on a later house and the third's on one of the last houses in the village. If we're right, we're hoping to reveal the history of the village from beginning to end. It's a big challenge, especially in this biting cold. And it might get even bigger, since we think the road extended into the next field and the village continued with it. Although the field's been heavily ploughed, geophys should reveal whether or not it did. I can't actually see it on the geophysics. I right. suspect it must have been ploughed out. I mean, there's no doubt that it came through yes, this field. Yeah, yeah. Can you see anything at all that we ought to dig a hole in with the machine? Well, to be honest, no. I mean, compare the results from here. Yes. It's full of sort of burnt features, rubbish pits and so on within the village. Yeah. Once you move beyond that field boundary, no evidence of settlement as far as I'm concerned. OK, well, let's, that's so well preserved, we've got enough work in there. Let's not do anything in here on the basis the geophysics doesn't show anything and concentrate in the main field. Yeah. For once, I'm quite relieved there's nothing here. We now know the full extent of the village and can concentrate our efforts on the lumps and bumps. And in Trench 3, we're beginning to uncover some pretty large chunks of masonry, possibly another medieval house. But Stuart still doesn't think we've tackled the whole village yet. This hollow way that runs through here that we're standing in, if you look on the other side, there's lots of earthworks on that side as well, this, this area I've highlighted in pink. 
There's a whole series of, of little strips down here with what appear to be some buildings inside them. And it's very higgledy-piggledy and very different to this very organised stuff up here. It doesn't look as regular. The earthworks aren't as good. And there's obviously got to be some reason for that. Mm. It's not, not like that. And that's one reason for doing the trench. Yeah. I'm not madly confident, given your track record so far, Stuart. <laughs> you know... I to clarify that, young man. <laughs> yeah. Can you see that trench through there? Yeah. Um, that was the one where you said there would be a building platform and no stone. Mm -hmm. There's no building platform and lots of stone. Right. <laughs> so, giving Stuart the benefit of the doubt for the moment, we're opening a fourth trench to see what's going on to the south of the road. The house platforms on this side seem to be less regular than the others, and we're hoping our trench will reveal how they fit in with the rest of the village. And shock horror, over in our first trench, Phil might actually have found some archaeology. Whoa! I think that's a bit of that coal stuff again. I think we've got a bit of a feature here. While this might be our first hint of that elusive early house, over in Bridges Trench, we're uncovering a whole floor plan. Naomi, how's the back of the, this building shaping up? Well, it's coming along quite nicely, Bridget. Um, as you can see, we've got these three quite large stones in what, the centre. These ones just in front of me here? Yeah, and it, it's kind of occurred to me that it looks like a face. Well, it does. I was just thinking the same thing, that they all are absolutely in a straight line there. And that is parallel with the stones that I've got up there that are marking where the front wall of the building would have been. Mm -hmm. So we might have both the front and back walls of the house. And they're not the only walls appearing on the side. I can almost see a line oh, there. Yeah, a straight line. Yeah, and there, they, yeah. They, they seem to be faced. It looks like we've uncovered two of the houses in the village, and what's more, Rakshar's also got some signs of occupation in hers. We've actually found quite a lot of slag from, um, you know, metal working. This is the waste product mm, from metal okay, working. Yeah. So this is what's giving the geophysics signal then? Yeah. So the question is, you know, is there some kind of furnace here? Is there any, you know, suggestion of, you know, industrial activity? So that's really quite exciting. You might have a, a medieval building and some medieval industrial activity. That would be, that'd be really interesting. Until now, we've mainly found rubble and stone, but this slag might be our first hint of what the villagers were actually doing in medieval Alnaby, which would be great because so far, the archaeology has not given much away about the lives of the villagers. But we do have a document which might help us, the Luttrell Psalter. The 14th century Psalter was commissioned by a Lincolnshire lord, Sir Geoffrey Luttrell. While primarily a book of Psalms, its illustrations paint a vivid picture of medieval peasant life. Not only as Sir Geoffrey had himself and his family depicted, but all those who worked his land, including the peasants who worked his fields for him. You kick off with the ploughman, and then we go to the sower and the seed. And here we've got reaping. It's all worked on, didn't they have any fun? Well, no, I mean, it was hard work, but there are some fantastic images in, in the, in the Luttrell Psalter of uh, participation in games and, and engaging yeah. in sporting endeavours. And here's a, it's a fantastic one. This, this man here, is, his, his friends are holding a pole and he's either limbo dancing <laughs> underneath it or, or it's some sort of uh, weightlifting competition <laughs> that he's engaged in. And here you've got the age-old pursuit of foot wrestling. And here you can see how your pot shirts got broken. Cool. When you see those in the trench, you don't actually think of how they might have been broken, do you? <laughs> And here, for example, a naked blue man sitting on a pole holding a pig's bladder as a balloon. Good old-fashioned entertainment. What more could you want? Back at the site, Phil could do with some entertainment because he's dug himself into a cold, dark hole. Once we get back here, there's absolutely nothing in the way of archaeology. There's no pot, there's no bone, there's absolutely nothing. Phil's feature seems to have mysteriously disappeared. It's equally bleak in our fourth trench, where Matt's uncovered something, but not what we expected. Matt, what have you got? I've got something that uh, you might be a bit disappointed in here. Uh, pipe stem. Tobacco pipe stem, isn't it? Yeah. So that's not medieval, is it? Can't possibly be, no. Well, I hope that doesn't... I hope that doesn't really hold too, home too many implications for this building. Matt's finding 17th century pipe here, not exactly fitting in with a picture of medieval Alnaby we're building up on the rest of the site. 
What's more, in Phil's trench, we're now fairly positive there's absolutely nothing there, which isn't what I was promised yesterday. I don't understand what's going on. It's kind of fun that Stuart's theory has been shot out of the water. But on the other hand, I can see there uh, is a zonking great earthwork here. There are other great big earthworks all around it. So what's going on? Perhaps the buildings and structures that went with those were far more ephemeral, built of timber or something like that. And, and we just don't see them in, in sections in a trench like this. Oh, come on, Mick. I mean, if there'd have been post holes here, I'd have seen them. If there'd have been beam slots here, I'd have been seen them when we, when we machined off. If there'd have been stone foundations, I would have seen them. Look, I'm not disputing that there's earthworks here. What I'm doubtful about is the interpretation of those yeah. earthworks. And what else could they be? Well, they could be hedgerows, property boundaries. They don't have to be buildings. Well, at least one thing's becoming very clear. Archaeology is all about the interpretation, with some considered calm debate thrown in. I mean, I agree with you, that's what the earthworks look like, but when we dig a hole in, there's nothing there. But it's... you're interpreting that as a building. Yeah, these, what we've got here, you can see them, these, these high bits and these low bits. We thought we'd put a trench here because we, we thought, thought, there might, thought there might be a structure hang here on, of some kind. On. There might be a structure here of some kind. Look, then, yeah. all right, if there wasn't a structure there, can you tell me why you asked me to put a trench on a high part, whereas it, with everywhere yeah. else on the site, when we've been looking for buildings, we've been digging up the holes in the lower parts, in the, in the well, basal... Yeah, yeah, no, no. yeah, the hollows. Yeah, but the, the hollows are defined by, defined by higher parts that define well, the edges around them. we should be digging them. in a hollow. Yeah, we, I hate to take sides, but at the moment I put it as field archaeologists one, landscape investigators nil. Sometimes the landscape can be a lonely place. But in Trench 3, we've discovered the walls which Stuart had predicted in the earthworks, and he's confident he can level up the scores. That looks interesting, Raksha. I know. <laughs> It's suddenly emerging. We've got this wall running along the trench, but I haven't got a clue where we are in the building. <laughs> I, I've got a clue. <laughs> <laughs> you, this is great, because what you're, you're on the gable end wall of a medieval longhouse that goes up that way. Ah. It's, it's for, let me show you. That's the inside. That's, that's outside there. Runs along here, and then it turns around where this bank comes along, up here, and back. Right the way down, I'm getting too old for this. <laughs> right, right the way down here. It's a classic sort of medieval longhouse. So Stuart's back on course with his medieval longhouse, and having studied the earthworks, he also thinks this was one of the last houses to be built in the village. On the other side of the site, we've been trying to discover Ulnaby's origins. And although there was no sign of an early house in Phil's trench, he's determined to keep searching, this time in a hollow. Bridge and Rakshar's buildings were found in hollows, so he's hoping to have more success. But to tell the whole story of Ulnaby, we now really need dates and finds, not just foundations. And in Bridge's trench, we might finally have got somewhere. It looks like a knife blade. Why do you say that? Well, can you see this side here? This looks like a blade yeah. coming along here. And then it comes up in this angle, and that's called the tang. And that's where the handle would have been fitted and probably made of wood because it no longer exists. I know you haven't had a chance to clean it up yet, but any kind of date? Well, given that it's got a slight curving nature to it, can you see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's very typical of medieval knives. But I think the most interesting thing is, is its position of where it's been found. What, you mean on top of those flags? Absolutely. Why is that significant? Well, in amongst it, we found a lot of pottery that has all been dated to the 13th, 14th centuries. This is a really good occupation layer. It really is evidence of those last people that lived in this building. Not only a great personal find, but we've now got a solid date for when this house went out of use. It's only one building, but one of the main goals on this site is trying to find out when and why this village was deserted. And if this happened in the 14th century, its demise fits in perfectly with one of the most catastrophic events in British history. Most deserted medieval villages were because of the Black Death, weren't they? Well, that's what we tend to think, you know. I mean, what's the great catastrophe in the Middle Ages? 
1348, 1349, the Black Death arrives, kills between a third and a half of the population. So when people found deserted village sites, they thought, oh, well, that must be the reason. But actually, there are very few of them that are actually depopulated by the Black Death. People that are left have got to carry on living, and very few villages are cleared out by it. So why did so many medieval villages collapse? The other big reason is a change of farming, particularly in the 15th and 16th centuries, where we hear, for example, of people being evicted from villages, when landlords are turning the village over from a, a, an arable farming estate, growing lots of crops, which needs a big labour force, to going over to sheep and cattle, where you only need a couple of stockmen or a couple of shepherds, so you get rid of the rest of the population. Before we can really speculate what caused Alnaby's desertion, we've got to find dating evidence across the whole site, not just one house. So nearly the end of day two, and everyone's digging like mad. Over in Matt's trench, we're now beginning to expose walls and a gravel floor surface. What's more, he's got some dating evidence for it. Date for it, that hot, please. OK. Well, very well be 14th century here, yeah? All oh, right. So, yet another medieval date for the village. And over in Phil's second trench, even he might have some archaeology. How you getting on, Phil? Oh, it's a lot more promising yeah, than that good. first trench you had me in. When we've got all <laughs> these stone here, look, it's far more looks like building material to me. There's that sort of chalky, mortary stuff. Look, vines coming up. Right. This is a lot more promising. With real archaeology in sight, Phil's a happy man again. But as the archaeology takes a turn for the better, the weather's taken a turn for the worse. As all the trenches become mud baths, it's time to call it a day. Tough old day today. Did we achieve much? Oh, my goodness, of course we did. I mean, we're now into buildings in various parts of the village. We've got walls, we've got floors. We're actually getting some dating evidence. That's the crucial thing. What about in your trench? Ah! Well, yeah, I didn't have a very good start with my first trench. That was a bit of a red airing. But now, in this new one, there's some really good, solid archaeology, and I'm sure that's going to come up with some great answers, too. And tomorrow we're going to be trying to get the very earliest origins of the village, aren't we? But in the meantime, what could be nicer of an evening than going down the tavern and indulging in a bit of medieval foot wrestling? So, seconds out, round one. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to County Durham. It's day three in our quest for the lost medieval village of Alnaby. And yesterday was a really frustrating day. It was tantalising. The weather was absolutely dreadful. But although we may not yet have found the origins of the village, in this trench here, it looks like we may be finding the middle and the end of our story. What is it that we've got, Matt? Well, down that end of the trench, you can see we've got the edge of the hollow way, the stony track there. That's quite late. We had a bit of tobacco pipe off there, so 17th century onwards. As we go up towards the front wall of the building, it's the same story. Tobacco pipe everywhere. Modern glass as well, so 18th century onwards, 17th century. And then as you go into the house, the gravel floor, even more tobacco pipe. They're obviously smoking loads. However, underneath that gravel surface, that's where we're getting the earlier pottery. We're getting green glazed pottery, so... Uh, 13th, 14th century, and it's the same out the back as well, over the back wall, a couple of bits of green glazed pottery. Apart from the fact that they were smoking like kippers, we don't seem to know very much about what the people who lived here were doing. Well, that's where I'm pinning my hopes out the back of the house, because um, out there we had this early pottery, and you know they would have cleaned out their houses, chucked all the rubbish out the back. Hopefully when we get down in there we might find rubbish pits and middens and stuff, which will tell us a bit more about what they were actually doing. Finally, we're not only getting individual dates for the village, we're starting to chart its development. We've got a 17th century house built on top of earlier 14th century occupation, which is the same date as the house found in Bridges Trench. With only a day to go, we really need to start piecing together all the evidence we've got from across the site. So we're collecting together all the pottery. By comparing the date range, we're hoping to chart the story of the whole village. But there's still a load to do, since we haven't reached the bottom of the trenches yet. Yesterday, Phil opened a second trench, hoping to find evidence of the village's origins. 
after his first trench proved so disastrous. We've now found a cobbled surface, but we think it's just a cattle yard. So Stewart's dragged a reluctant Phil back to his first trench, where he's convinced he can actually see a post hole. As far as he's concerned, solid evidence of an early house. What is all this stuff if it isn't something somebody stuck in the ground along the edge of an earthwork platform within a plot? I'll tell you what, <laughs> I'll tell you what, if you had a big stone like that and you hooked it out with a plough and it filled up with dirty soil, you'd get exactly <laughs> something like that. Well, I think it's too much of a coincidence on the edge of this platform, on this platform, and you've got evidence of timber structures in the ground. I'm not still... We haven't got timber well, structures. That... You might have one <laughs> post hole. Despite his protests, I can tell Phil's intrigued, and he's decided to extend the trench to see if there are any further post holes running along the bank. And almost immediately, he's into archaeology. Bone, well preserved. We've been finding animal bones among the medieval pottery all over the site, and they're revealing quite a lot about our medieval peasants. We can tell that they were butchering, eating and cooking these animals. For example, this bone here is quite dark, uh, black, and we can tell that's been burnt. And another really nice piece is uh, part of a cattle vertebrae, and uh, we can see a nice, clean uh, buttery mark here, so you can imagine a knife just going straight through it. Are these the kind of animals you'd have expected us to find? Yeah, pretty much. If we think about Sir Geoffrey Luttrell and his slaughter, uh, we know from his estate in Yorkshire um, that when it was surveyed, they had, um, for example, 10 horses, 13 oxen for pulling ploughs, etc., um, 8 cattle and 3 sheep, and that they owed the Lord 64 chickens worth a penny each at Christmas. The animal bones and the lateral salter paint a vivid picture of the agricultural lives of our 14th century peasants. And despite this being a modern farm, we've also got evidence of medieval ploughing perfectly preserved in rows of ridge and furrow in the surrounding fields. Mick's keen to experience how they work these fields, and he's called in experimental archaeologists to find out. Well, wow, look at this then, Ian. You haven't seen this in one of your fields. No, no not for a long time. That's brilliant, that yes. is. Well, this is as close a representation as we could have actually got to the plough that was illustrated in the lateral psalter. This is... So it's a replica of a 14th century medieval plough. That's right. Fantastic. It's very, very similar to a modern plough. Works very much in the same sort of way. We've got the, uh, we've got the vertical cutting blade, the coulter. Yeah. And behind it, we've got the share, and that cuts on the horizontal. So that's cutting that way, and that's cutting that way. That's right. Right. And that pushes the soil, cuts the soil, and as the plough comes forward, this component, the mool board, turns the earth over to form the ridge against right. the furrow. So do you think these things could have created the ridge and furrow, these plough ridges that we see in the fields then? I think it's quite possible they could have done. It's uh, the continual use of the same pattern of land ploughed and ploughed and ploughed again, following the same furrows right. along and creating those ridges. OK, I'm ready when you are, Pete. Right. Together, lads. If you'd like to learn more about the lives of medieval peasants, log on to the Time Team website. As we attempt to understand more about medieval ploughing and put our replica medieval plough to the test, it's now middle of day three, and the site's become a hive of activity. Over in Bridges Trench, she's found a coin. It's in great condition. Oh, wow, it is, isn't it? I can't read the date, but if you look at it, you can actually see around the outside of it, you can see some lettering coming up. Oh, yeah, yes, can. It actually dates from the reign of Edward I in the 14th century and fits in perfectly with the 14th century pottery and knife that Bridge found earlier. Matt's perseverance has also paid off, and he's uncovered a medieval quern stone reused in his 17th century wall. Right, so there should be a kind of slightly concave, smooth surface on the other side. On the underside, that's right. That's uh... pretty good. This would have been used to grind the cereal which the villagers harvested. But while individual finds are great, they only give us tiny snapshots of the village. But having collected together all the pottery from across the site, we now think we can build up a complete story. 
Bridge, what strikes me is the enormous amount of green stuff we've got here. Well, there is. There is a, a huge amount of lead-glazed ware here, fairly local pottery. The important thing is, and it's been found in all the trenches to date, and it's dated to about the late 13th, 14th century. It really seems as though this community was here at its zenith in that time. Yeah, because we've got 13th and 14th here, all along here, all down here, here, here. It's the vast majority of the pottery we've found, isn't it? That's it. I mean, in, in Matt's trench, and Raksha's trench, and my trench, that's what is coming out. That's what the houses seem to be dated to. But in Raksha's trench, we've got much more modern stuff, the post-medieval. That's right. It does seem that in about, you know, the 16th, 17th century, there's, there's a, a redevelopment of the community here. So we can now date all the houses in our trenches back to the 14th century placing the village smack bang in the medieval period. But we've been calling this a deserted medieval village, and so it should end in the medieval period, before the end of the 15th century. But our finds suggest it continued for at least another 300 years, and what's more, the documents seem to confirm this later occupation. In the middle of the 14th century, Omnaby came into the hands of the Neville family. Now, they're a leading landowning family in this part of the country, and they've got many manors and, and castles uh, spread across the north. Um, and they held on to Omnaby until 1570, when Omnaby was confiscated from uh, the head of the family, Charles, um, Earl of Westmoreland, for his uh, role in the failed rising of the north on behalf of Mary, Queen of Scots, against uh, Queen Elizabeth. Various of the villagers were involved in that rising, and I've got a document from 1570, which which lists the villagers who were pardoned for their participation in that, uh, in that rising. Do we have any names? Absolutely. We've got people like John Eyre, Roland Cotney, John Byrne, William Douthwaite, various members of the Worthy family. What date is this again? This is 1570. And the other thing, of course, that's interesting about it is it means there are quite a few people, people living, living here yeah, in 1570. Yeah. So this is not a deserted medieval village. So if Alnaby didn't end in the medieval period, when and why did the village disappear? The Black Death could have decimated the village in the 14th century, but it certainly didn't kill it off. And the villagers obviously weren't evicted in the 15th century. While the archaeologists ponder this conundrum, at least our ploughing experiment has produced some positive results. Whoa there. Yeah, oh, that looks better, Neil. You made some improvements, have you? We've made a few adjustments, Mick. Yeah, well, I can see uh, it was just gliding through really smooth there. But we have encountered other problems with right. it. Right. The mull board on the side. Yeah. What's been happening is that the soil has been hitting this central part here. Right. And it's been moving over to both sides around the plough. Right. Whereas what we want is for it to all kick up onto the right-hand side off the mull board. So if we can move that bit further forward, that might, that might just do that. So it looks as if whoever drew the little picture on the, the lateral salter knew about ploughs, but they probably weren't a ploughman. They haven't got it quite accurate. That seems to be exactly the case. Our intention was to try and recreate yeah. the plough exactly as the picture was. So this has worked up to a point. Yeah. It's only very small um, little alterations that we need to make to make a much more efficient plough. Yeah. Although it needs a few adjustments, our replica plough has brought us much closer to the daily lives of our medieval peasants. And it seems to be quite a cold, miserable existence, probably one our archaeologists can identify with. And the coldest, loneliest trench has to be Phil's, where hours of digging has revealed virtually nothing. Still scraping away there, Phil? Yeah, no more post holes, uh, Stuart. Yeah. What's, what, what's this then, Phil, coming this line of stones down here on that alignment? Well, uh, yeah, that is uh, a line of stones. I don't know what they are. Well, it's interesting because it's following the, the line again of this earthwork bank uh, behind. Uh, uh, yeah, but it? this extension was put in to chase this line of post holes, which you told me were there. But I can assure you, there are no more post holes ah, here. You got, yeah, you haven't got to the end of your trench yet. And this is on the same alignment. The, the post hole up there is, is that side of it, isn't it? So <laughs> this <laughs> might be part of something coming this way. Keep, keep scratching. You, yeah, but I keep scratching. You keep changing your mind. <laughs> this must be one of the most frustrating trenches we've ever had on Time Team. First a feature, then no feature. We get fines and then nothing. But even without a date or any archaeology in the ground, Stuart's sticking to his guns, convinced that these lumps and bumps are the remains of a house plot and that somewhere within it is one of the earliest buildings in the village. 
While we've run out of time to test this theory, we've had far more success in Bridges Trench, and we've positively dated a 14th century building. Can you set me your house? I will do. We're now going into the backyard. See those stones there? We've been assuming that that's the wall, of the, the back wall of the house, but it seems that it's actually a post pad. So you've had great big posts coming up either side of the entrance. I love these flagstones. They're beautiful, aren't they? Yeah. And they're generally positioned in the centre of the house. So this is where you would have performed your essential domestic duties, where you would have had your hearth and things like that. And over here? Well, on the, you can see the end of the flagstones, and this is where we would have had a timber, a timber wall mm -hmm. coming up here. This and is the back wall. That's the back wall. Yeah. And on this side of it, you've still got that revetment wall acting as a boundary or an endpoint to your property. These foundations were once part of a 30-foot wooden longhouse, which would have been covered with a thatched roof. It wasn't the last house to be built or lived in in Ulnaby, because in both Matt and Rakshar's trenches, we found evidence of people living here right up to the 17th century. And what's more, Rakshar's discovered not one, but two houses. The wall seems to be sitting on top of this yellow clay layer. Like down in the corner there? Yeah. It's actually running underneath this wall. Now, anything on the other side of that wall should be the exterior. Right. But it all seems to be the same layer. It looks like a floor surface. Now, we might have a possibility of a post hole in the corner. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. So, was there an earlier timber phase here? And then somebody knocked that down mm. and then built the stone building? Well, that's very interesting because the earthwork plan suggests that there's been bigger plots subdivided later on, on here. And it looks as if you've got the archaeological evidence for that. So we've got two building phases in Rakshar's trench, a timber structure, very much like the house in Bridges' trench, then a later 14th century stone longhouse built on top of it. We know from the pottery that it was occupied for the next 300 years, but was that the end of Alnaby village? The last time I can pick up any real evidence for a village being here mm. is in the early 17th century. Because in 1629, Alnaby was passed to Francis and Stephen Thompson, gentlemen. Right. We don't know much about them, but this document does tell us about their estate. And Alnaby consisted of five messages. Sort of oh, that's five farmsteads, isn't farmsteads, it? Farmsteads, yeah. 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 Three cottages, five barns, yeah. three gardens, with 100 acres of arable, 100 acres of meadow, and 200 acres of pasture. So it's still a sizable community. It's still there. I mean, community. You know, if you've got 100 acres of arable, you've got to have a labour force to work it. It sounds like one of these gradual, slow winds down as people clear off, the older people die off, and eventually it just dies on its feet. So, after three challenging days, I think we've finally cracked the story of medieval Alnaby and its villagers. While we haven't tied down a date for its origins, we've discovered the village was well established by the 14th century. It then flourished for at least 400 years, surviving upheavals like the Black Death until its gradual decline in the 17th century. And for the next 400 years until now, a few documents, the farmhouse and this lumpy field were the only clues that the village of Almaby ever existed at all.